All right, um, great. So we're in the uh, final, final uh, call of the Insure Staff Education webinar series. Uh, and Dr. Vicki Pratt from Indiana University is going to talk to us about pharmacogenetics. All right, great. Thank you, Bob, for having me talk for the final, final, final one on pharmacogenetics today. So um, I thought I'd give you a couple of objectives of what we're going to go over today. We're going to talk about the star allele nomenclature, which is specific to pharmacogenetics, um, and then differentiate between um, various metabolizer phenotypes. And this is all part of the pharmacogenomic and pharmacogenetic uh, uh, words that are often used um, when we talk about pharmacogenetics, and then recognize that common drugs that can have adverse drug reactions. So, so I'm going to talk, I'll use pharmacogenomics and pharmacogenetics somewhat in, interchangeably, but really we're talking about precision medicine and getting the right dose to the right patient. So if if you look really what is pharmacogenetics that you can go on the you can Google on the web and look at different sort of definitions, but it's really about genetic changes that um, can give rise to different responses to different drugs, uh, and looking at that in, in that those genetic changes and how they affect drug metabolism. So this is from the Personalized Medicine Coalition uh, from a report a few years back. And they, if you look at various different kinds or types of drugs, people respond to them differently. If you look at hypertension, specifically ACE inhibitors, about a quarter of folks cannot, um, who take this drug, it doesn't work for them. And beta blockers, it's about 15 to 25 percent of those drugs don't work well for them. Antidepressants, up to 50 percent of antidepressants are ineffective. Statins, it can be up to 70 percent. And asthma or the beta-2 agonists, it can be also up to 70 percent. So there's a lot of trial and error to see if a medication will work for, for people. And looking at pharmacogenetics is a way to help re reduce that trial and error. So this is a partial list that I put together a few years back of some various kinds of changes in genes and some of the drugs that are involved um, involved with those with the sort of a drug gene um, pair. Um, there's two important concepts when you're thinking about pharmacogenetics, and I'm a geneticist, so I that's my caveat is is I tried to make this. So that if I can understand it as a geneticist, that hopefully everybody else can understand it, is that pharmacokinetics is what the body does to a drug. So if we look at the first image, the this is an active drug that the body inactivates over time. Then in the second profile, this is an inactive drug that the body activates um, and then slowly inactivates over time. Pharmacodynamics is what the drug does, does to the body. Where is the most effective dose of the drug? This is when you take, so when you take a medication, you take it twice a day or three times a day with meals. Um, so you will see peaks or I mean troughs and peaks of drug concentration in the body. And the idea is to eliminate um, those, the effects of the peaks and troughs and keep, it, keep the drug concentration in the body at the most effective concentration. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is not necessarily the pharmacodynamics, but we're going to talk about pharmacokinetics, especially related to some of the drugs and genes that we're talking about. So if we look at adverse drug reactions, about 6 to 7 percent of all hospitalizations have an adverse or a result of an adverse drug, drug reaction, and it accounts for about 100,000 deaths each year, or about the fourth leading cause of death. 
one in five or 20% of drug candidates that are under development are actually terminated due to an adverse drug reaction that is seen in patients. So I like to think, I'll, and here I'm talking about pharmacogenomics, that, that, that there are three major kinds. We have our inherited or constitutional changes in our DNA, um, in a patient's DNA or our DNA that affect how drugs are metabolized in our body. So, and that's where we're going to spend a lot of the, this talk today. The other one is the somatic or tumor-specific changes, and this is the KRAS and the BCR ABLES and C kits and BRAS, where there is a lot of work of really targeting that cancer to a specific drug to kill that cancer or control that cancer. And then what we're not going to talk about today um, that I like to think of in pharmacogenomics is also for infections such as HIV and HCV, there's changes in those viral genomes um, that, that drugs are specifically targeted against. So based on the variants seen in HIV or HCV, there are certain drugs that are more effective in treating those um, infections. But we're not going to talk about those. Um, I want to introduce you to a specific term called a companion diagnostic, and that's where most of the oncology type stuff is area is right now. And this is where the drug and the pharmacogenetic test are approved by the FDA at about the same time. So a drug manufacturer, they're working on um, looking at lung cancer and they see that ALK, um, this drug works in ALK positive breast cancers and so that, that test and that drug went through the FDA at, at the same or similar time and were approved together by the FDA as a companion diagnostic. So let's talk about the inherited or constitutional variants. They're primarily closed of, of a gene family called the cytochrome P450s. Most of these proteins are located predominantly in the liver and they're involved in the toxin and drug metabolism of the body. So I want to introduce you to the nomenclature around the cytochrome P450s. So, because it can be a little bit confusing. So the star is called star allele nomenclature, and a star one is considered the normal allele where no variant or mutation is detected. All the star alleles are numbered in order of description, and there are suballeles that are alphabetized in the order of description. And there's a website um, that was started out of the Karolinska Institute in Sweden um, that summarizes all these star alleles. And I will disclose that um, this is actually the folks that started it in Sweden um, are actually retiring, so this is moving to being a U.S. and multinational consortium, and I and I am on that um, consortium that we're taking where, where we're taking over the star allele nomenclature. So if I show you an example, so if we look at cytochrome 2D6, so cytochrome CYP is for cytochrome. It's this is the protein family, the 2D6, so it's the family 2, subfamily D, isoenzyme 6, if you're looking at the protein. Um, this CYP2D6 itself is just is it also the gene. So since I'm a geneticist, we're mostly going to talk about the gene. Then we have a nice star here, and after the star um, is the, so if we have a star four, it's the third, remember star one is no variant detected, so it's the third variant described, and then if we have an F, it's the fifth subvariant described in that, in that gene. So this is an example from the CYP allele website looking at 2D6, 
star four, and this is just a partial list. So to be a star four, you have to have an 1846 G to A, um, and this is in HGVS nomenclature. So you have to have an 1846, and that's what's in bold on this in this slide. Um, so that's the defining variant. Um, this is old school haplotype analysis. So also on that same allele, um, you usually see a 100 C to T variant and a 4180 G to C variant. And you can see in all these sort of sub alleles, there's different combinations of other variants that were observed in that haplotype. I'll also point out specifically down here, remember our 1846 is our defining a variant in STAR-4, but in this instance here in STAR-4M, 100 C to T and 4180 G to C were not observed. So there can be STAR-4 alleles that don't have the 100 C to T or the 4180 G to C in it. So if we look at each allele, one, one that we inherit from mom and one we inherit from our father, um, that taking all those variants, we're going to assign a function to that allele. So CPIC, which is the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, CPIC, um, there's a website here, put together a project of trying to standardize that nomenclature of allele function designation. So a normal, there's such, so a normal allele, or even if we, most of the time it's like our star one, that is a normal function allele. An allele can be a decreased function allele, you can have a no function or non-functional allele, an increased functional allele, and then if you uncertain that you can have an uncertain or unknown functional, especially in newer alleles as different methodologies such as next generation sequencing, and there's a, a unique combination that is observed and you really don't know whether the function of the allele in that in that individual. So in so when a when a lab looks at uh, the various combination of alleles that, and assign a function, they use that to assign a metabolizer status. And a metabolizer status is just the phenotype or the predictive phenotype based on the genetic variants observed in a person. So if you look at a normal metabolizer, and I have in parentheses that it's called an EM, it used to be called an extensive metabolizer, but most, but again, back to CPIC, that, that group standardized nomenclature in pharmacogenomics. So um, if you have two functional alleles, you're called a normal metabolizer, and in the old school, it, it was previously known as extensive metabolizer, which you may see in the literature. Somebody who has a decreased functional allele and a non-functional allele or no functional allele, um, that person is called a reduced metabolite, or excuse me, I have this one in sort of a different nomenclature. It's called an intermediate metabolizer, and that's my bad. And um, but it is it's sort of a reduced functional allele or reduced metabolizer. So the correct nomenclature here is intermediate metabolizer, which is this I am. Um, but think of this as a reduced metabolizer. There's a poor metabolizer that has two no functional alleles. Um, or a PM, and then there's a rapid metabolizer um, which has one increased function allele or an ultra-rapid metabolizer which has more than one increased function allele. Um, so if, so um, I want to sort of give you how I think of this 
is that if you look at a normal distribution of people, and in general when you're talking about drug metabolism, most of the time you're worried about the people at the far ends, the ultra-rapid metabolizers and the poor metabolizers. Um, in the middle is the normal metabolizers. Oops, I clicked quick. Um, are the normal metabolizers. And then you have this sort of reduced intermediate metabolizer between the normal and the poor metabolizers. Um, if you're looking at different, even though your genotype doesn't change, you can look at various different drugs, and in some people that window is really a narrow window between for the intermediate reduced metabolizer, and in others that windows can be much bigger. And it's, that is drug specific, not necessarily genetic specific. I want to introduce you to also, um, it's not just your, your genetic changes, but there are other things that affect metabolizer status. Um, there are certain non-drugs that can affect um, metabolizer status. So if you've ever taken a medication that says do not take with grapefruit juice, and the reason is, I should say grapefruit and grapefruit juice, is that it inhibits cytochrome 3A4. And this is one of the major pathways that many drugs go through. Um, broccoli, actually, if you eat your broccoli, um, it actually induces cytochrome 1A2 to work a little bit better. Um, if you take St. John's wort, and some people, this is uh, an herbal supplement that many people take um, over the counter when they are feeling a little blue or for depression, this actually induces the 3A4. Now, if you look, grapefruit inhibits and St. John induces. I'm not sure that they cancel each other out, um, but I, and, and I wouldn't try this at home, but it, there are things that can, can affect how, how um, our cytochrome P450s work. So I'm going to go over one of our first examples. It's cytochrome 2D6. There are more than 100 different unique alleles that have been described. And it's estimated to metabolize about one-fourth of all drugs. Um, remember, I told you that we need to worry about our ultra-rapid and our poor metabolizers. About 5 to 10 percent of Caucasians are actually poor metabolizers for cytochrome 2D6. Um, some of the medications that 2D6 metabolizes, um, some are antidepressants such as fluox fluoxetine, and I will apologize in advance that I screw up the pronunciation of many medications. Um, it can, it's involved in, in pain management such as codeine, antipsychotics, and then there are drugs that such as fluoxetine, if you're taking it, it actually can inhibit 2D6. So that's important for the people that are, are intermediate or reduced metabolizers that, that where fluoxetine may not work very well because while it goes through the 2D6 pathway, it also inhibits the 2D6 pathway. We're going to talk about a specific sample with, with 2D6 related to codeine. Um, codeine can be used in the tra treatment for pain. Um, it also can be used in, to treat coughs and um, diarrhea. It, uh, you may have seen on TV, there's commercials that say, if, what is it, um, opioid-induced constipation. So codeine is one of those that is uh, opioid-induced, causes opioid-induced constipation. So it can be used to treat diarrhea. Um, in the U.S., um, it, is, it is currently accepted for medical use, but it has severe restrictions. So you need a, essentially you need a prescription to get codeine. Um, in Canada and other countries, you can actually get it from behind the counter in the, in the pharmacy without prescription. Um, there is abuse of codeine and that it can lead to severe psychological or physical dependence on, on codeine. So codeine is largely an inactive drug. It does have some pain um, 
can alleviate some pain, but it's largely an inactive drug that is metabolized through 2D6 to its more active form, morphine. And then there's clinical pharmacogenetic implementation consortium guidelines related to your, your, your genetics and how to dose for that. Um, in the U.S., there's actually a black box label or black box warning on um, coding, especially for nursing mothers. Coding and morphine actually, I should say morphine, can get in the breast milk. And there's been um, um, babies that were nursing that actually died because they've got too much um, morphine at one time, and these these babies have died. So this has led to a black box warning about coding that people that are ultra rapid metabolizers get too much coding too fast, especially children. Um, and this is why coding is also contraindicated in tons kids getting tonsillectomies. That that ultra rapid metabolizers get too much morphine and they can stop breathing. So about one to ten percent of Caucasians are ultra rapid metabolizers. Three percent of African Americans are ultra rapid metabolizers. About one percent of um, Asian, especially Chinese, Japanese, and Hispanics are ultra rapid. And and in the population that's really high ultra rapid metabolizer status is North. Africans, Ethiopians, and Saudi Arabians with a little over a quarter of people um, are ultra-rapid metabolizers. So this is from um, PharmGKB website. And if you look at coding, and remember, all our cytochrome P450s are mostly in the liver. So coding gets into the liver um, and then goes to do through the 2D6 pathway here to become its more active form, morphine. So remember, if we looked at um, the pharmaco, uh, pharmaco, see now I get confused again. Um, if we look at the profile of this drug, this is the inactive drug that gets activated and then inactivated through these pathways and eliminated um, from, from the liver and the body. So if we look at dosing for coding in intermediate metabolizers, um, it is recommended to increase the dose of coding because it may have insufficient pain relief. And either that or consider alternate analgesics. Um, for poor metabolizers, it doesn't really, coding doesn't really work at all for these folks and that you should avoid code, giving coding to them. And another drug that's also used for pain relief, which is tramadol, that goes through the same pathway. And ultra-rapid metabolizers, so this one you're using for um, avoiding because of inefficacy of the drug. The, just, the drug just doesn't work very well. And ultra-rapid metabolizers, it also is recommended to, to avoid coding and tramadol because this in these folks, the, the coding gets transport or changed into morphine way too fast, and it can cause um, issues or with people to stop breathing. So in adults, especially in children and newborns, though in adults, most people tolerate it fairly well. Because um, I've known a few ultra-rapid metabolizers, and they really like coding because it really kicks the pain real fast. Um, so if you're looking at CPIC guidelines, and this is from the CPIC guidelines, um, that offer rapid metabolizers, and this is sort of what I just put in that summary slide, is that avoid coding due to potential toxicity, and poor metabolizers avoid coding due to lack of efficacy. Um, there's, I'm not going to go into this uh, slide way too much, but there are um, DNA test um, or, or DNA testing platforms that are available through for lab. This is more for the lab folks who would be interested. Another example we're going to talk about today is cytochrome 2C19. Um, there's more than 25 alleles described with this gene, and about 3 to 5 percent of Caucasians are poor metabolizers, and about 15 to 20 percent of Asians are poor metabolizers for 2C19. 
Some of the medications that go through 2C19 are the proton pump inhibitors, such as Prilosec or Omeprazole, and antidepressants um, like amitriptyline, citalopram, escitalopram, um, clomip. Bromine, and then um, what, an example we're going to talk about today is clopidogrel or Plavix. Um, this is just uh, this is looking at the star alleles, and and this is how the labs and and people predict um, the metabolizer phenotype and looking at the various combinations. So as you can see. Um, where no variant is detected, or our STAR1 um, metabolizer, or our STAR1 STAR1s are our normal metabolizer, and it's in that, and about 35 to 50 percent of people sort of fall in this range. Um, the more common alleles are STAR2 in Caucasians and STAR3 in Asians, and the rest of these, these changes in STAR and 2C19 are, are more rare. So if we look at our example of clopidogrel or Clavix, it is used to treat um, coronary artery disease, peripheral artery disease, and cere cerebrovascular disease. It is metabolized by cytochrome P450. Again, this is an inactive drug that gets activated in the body, and it has this nice big long name that I'm not going to talk say. Um, a few years back, the FDA announced that um, if you're taking clopidogrel, it can't be taken with omeprazole or esomeprazole because they actually inhibit 2C19. Um, it's used to, it's also, clopidogrel is used um, to, um, in NSTEMI and STEMI and along with aspirin to prevent um, thrombosis after stent placement. In 2010, the FDA changed the black box warning on the label to say that poor metabolizers do not effectively convert Plavix to its active form. And then there was a big media campaign in magazines and on TV to, to let people know that poor metabolizers uh, should not be treated with Plavix. At the time this black box warning went into effect, there were no other medications that were available um, as alternatives uh, to Plavix or clopidogrel. The FDA recently updated the label, and I put this in red just this past fall in 2016, that the, the drug label suggests that there are different um, P, uh, platelet um, PY, P2Y12 inhibitors that can be in used in patients identified as poor metabolizers. So if we look at clopidogrel here, remember it's an inactive drug that goes through, and this is a little always sort of different, these pathways are, there's probably a lot of things that are not here, but it goes through and then 2C19 here, as well as various other genes, um, to become the active metabolite. And then, then this active metabolite with the big long name then binds to the receptor on the platelet to prevent it from, from aggregating or, or developing a clot. So if this is blocked, then, it, then clopidogrel is just eliminated through the body and, cannot, and then cannot bind to the platelet. So the CPIC guidelines recommend that um, that um, if you're an intermediate metabolizer, that you take Presagrel or Ticagrelor or some other alternative therapy if there's no contraindication, as well as the poor metabolizers. Also, you take Presagrel or Ticagrelor or some other therapy if there's no contraindication. In the ultra-rapid metabolizers, um, you, it's fine to take clopidogrel. You get a little bit more through the system a little bit faster. It does not. Um, it doesn't cause any issues. Um, so it, it has been reported with some association for a risk for, for bleeding. Again, this is the CPIC guidelines that I just summarized on the previous slide, so I'm not going to go through that again. 
And for the lab folks or people that are interested, there are uh, there's lab developed tests or lab developed procedures as well as FDA and research only um, platforms for performing testing. There is one test out here. I'm just going to remark on this one. This is more of a point of care test. This verified now. It's a platelet function test. Uh, our platelet function assay that does not test for the genetic variants but only looks at the uh, platelet function to see how well um, uh, it, the clopidogrel is binding to the, the receptor. We're not going to go too much over this slide, it's only to say that there is some variability in the platforms of what alleles that, that, that they test. We're going to go into our third example, which is warfarin or coumadin. Um, and when it was named, I thought a little interesting bit of trivia that warfarin got its name from the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation or WARF that originally patented. So just to be a little silly, so if, if Indiana patented, it would have been IARF. Um, I think WARF sounds a little bit better. Um, so good thing it was um, named in Wisconsin instead of Indiana. Um, so it was originally market, marketed as rat poison. So basically the rats would go, it was mixed with corn, the rats would go eat the corn with the warfarin on it, and then they'd go off and bleed to death and, and die. So in um, the early 1950s, there was a military recruit that really didn't want to go into the Army and so tried to um, become a rat-like and eat the eat warfarin, eat, um, eat the rat poison, and then really started research into the anticoagulation properties of warfarin. Right now, it's prescribed more than 30 million times in the U.S. each year and accounts for um, about 40, a little over 40,000 ER visits each year as when people are un can get unstable in it. There's a very narrow therapeutic window for, for warfarin. Um, so you get a little too much, you bleed. You not get enough, you clot. So it's part of that whole clotting cascade that, that, that um, keeping that in control can be difficult at times. Um, there's two major genes associated with about 40% of the variability in the drug response for 2C9, and those are 2C9 and v c one I will tell you, uh, I think I got the slide in here. Um, there's a website called warfarindosing.org. Um, there, are, there are some other websites, but this is probably one of the ones that um, many people use. Um, that can take somebody's genotype and look at their genotype, their, their weight, their height, their age, other medications that the patient's taking, and then help predict what's the most optimum um, starting dose for, and, for, and how to change the dose of warfarin for a patient. Currently, uh, patients are monitored um, with an INR or an international rate normalized ratio. So somebody who's had a blood clot and are taking warfarin, you really want their INR between two to three. If it goes significantly over four, that patient is at risk for a bleed. And um, my grandmother, who, is, who has since passed away, when she, she had a blood clot in her leg and was prescribed warfarin, and the first time she took her first dose of warfarin, her INR went to, and she was in, in the hospital at this time, her INR went to 12. Um, and so just to say that that one dose, that's how fast the INR can go up and change and, and, and cause a bleed and, and, and somebody can die um, from that. So if you do a genetic test or have the genetic information that can help with, that can help keep that from going up so high. So if you look at the package insert on warfarin, um, based on the genotype, it really says um, what, how to get to a therapeutic INR. 
So if you have, remember, star one, star one is no variant detected. So if you're star one, star one, and you have the GG um, or non-variant for VCOR C1, you really start this dose at five, five to seven milligrams per day. So in somebody that's a poor metabolizer um, for, two, for 2C9, somewhere down here, you want to start them with a much lower dose um, because then the, the avoid their getting iron R from getting um, too high. So if we look at 2C9, there's more than 35 allele um, described. And um, what I haven't completely mentioned, um, I, I touched on a little bit, is that certain alleles are more common in certain ethnic populations. So in for 2C9, the more common alleles that you see in the Caucasian frequency were star 2 and star 3, and when originally were for dosing Dot and on the package insert, you really only see the star two and star three and doesn't really um, account for other ethnicities, people of other ethnic backgrounds as well. Um, so in African Americans, you'll, you'll see the star four, or I mean the star five and the star six and some other ones. So I do know CPIC is updating that and I, their guidelines around that for different ethnicities and I do have a slide on that. Coming up, so v C1, um, vitamin K23 epoxide reductase subunit 1, um, really is a haplotype. Most people test for this minus 1639. There's some people that may also test for this 1173C to T, um, but there's other variants in the haplotype, um, and I believe in warfarin.org, it really only accounts and, um, for the 1639 because this is all. You only really need to test this when these are additional variants that aren't, aren't necessarily needed to be tested. Um, so this is the updated algorithm that um, CPIC just published um, earlier this year in 2017 that if you look at warfarin dosing, so um, is there a genotype available, yes or no? Then it really talks about the different ethnicities that, that if it's non-African ancestry, it's really fine to do the v core C1 and the 2C9 star 2 star 3 and then do a dose calculation on that. If you look at the African American ancestry, you really need to test for different variants, specifically star 5, star 6, star 8, and star 11. And then that dosing may change. And then there's another recent variant that's been published. Um, and I'm not sure which gene this is in. Um, that that looks at this and and you and you change the dosing because warfarindosing.org originally didn't have good good um, algorithms around African Americans. But I believe they have updated that, but I'm not sure. So there are different platforms to test for um, warfarin that include 2C9 and VCOR C1, but the variants are different among those different platforms. Our fourth example that we're going to talk about today is UGT1A1. So mostly we've talked about phase one metabolism, you know, taking a drug sort of at the beginning of the pathway. Here is, this, this is UGT1A1 is about phase two metabolism, and this is about eliminating the drug from the body. So um, UGT1A1 is a, is, a, is a complex, and I'll show you a slide in a second, um, that, that I'll show you that slide in a second. Um, it's used f um, for metastatic colon cancer drug arenotecan, um, and also arenotecan is in a, a drug combination of, such as Fulfox and Fulfury. 
um, and then a tanzivir for HIV therapy. This is also is a gene that's involved in Gilbert syndrome, a genetic disorder of um, hyperbilirubinemia. It doesn't cause any, um, it, there, um, that just causes transient hyperbilirubinemia or jaundice. So if we look at, um, we look at, um, this is the UGT1A1 gene complex. Um, so there's these common exons, two, three, four, and five down here. But there's different alternative first exons. So depending on which ex first exon is spliced onto it is which complex it is. So we're going to talk about UGT1A1 right here, which is spliced to the common exons. There in the promoter of UGT1A1 is a TA repeat or a TATA box that turns the gene on, that turns the gene on. And this is the most of the variants that we're going to talk about for, for the drugs that we're going to talk about today. So if we look at UGT1A1 in a Reno TCAN, the TA repeat in the promoter or the TATA box, um, uh, can affect how well the the metabolism of areno T can. So it's um, it's areno T can is an inactive drug that gets activated to SN38, and then it's inactivated through UGT1A1. Um, and I'll show you that slide in a second. And this is called phase two metabolism. So in the TA repeat, normally you have seven or six TA repeats, but there are some people that have seven TA repeats or eight TA repeats. So that um, causes um, ureno TCAN, so that promote, there's a promoter problem with the protein, and it um, causes um, uh, a buildup of that active form and it inactivates areno TCAN more slowly, which causes an increased risk for toxicity, including um, high grade neutropenia and or diarrhea. So areno TCAN inactive goes through this pathway to become SN38, its active form, and then um, then is inactivated through the UGT1A1 pathway here and eliminated from the body. But if there's a blockage in this pathway or a backup, you know, a partial blockage in this pathway, this builds up to quit, this builds up too much, causing neutropenia and, and, and the severe diarrhea. This is like death by diarrhea here, bad, bad diarrhea. So if we look at the UGT1A1 frequency, in Caucasians about a third um, carry this, this TA repeat, about half of African Americans and, and about 10 percent, uh, 10 to 15 percent of Asians. Um, there is, um, there is, you can have five TA repeats, and this is called a star 36, or you can have eight TA repeats, which is a star 37. And both of these are a little bit more common in the African American population. So, um, because a Reno T can is used um, for metastatic colon cancer, um, there's not really very many other drug alternatives by the time a patient gets put on a Reno T can. So, um, it is recommended to reduce the dose. So, this testing is not used so much anymore because most people um, give the patients a loading dose because there's not really any alternative and then just see how well they respond to it and then slowly increase the dose for tolerance. So in the FDA label, it does say that UGT, there is a UGT1A1 test that's available and that can detect the, and remember, um, six re TA repeats is, uh, is our star one, star one, star one, star 28, and our star 28, star 28 genotypes. So um, uh, 
the, the here's the decision tree. Uh, remember, in uh, full Fox and full Fernox or full Fury, this is a Reno T can in this sort of drug combination, and and it's more about if if you're doing high doses. Um, uh, you really need UGT1A1 genotyping, uh, or, or actually, this is your low dose, sorry. Low dose, you don't really need it. Um, if you're doing high dose, sorry, I sort of got that backward for a second. Um, if you're doing high dose, it's really recommended to do the UGT1A1 genotyping and then um, looking at that there's a toxicity around it. But mostly in the U.S., what they do is they give you the low dose and then titrate it for um, just uh, to, to, till you sort of don't get to start making you sick. There was an FDA cleared platform that had been, that's been discontinued um, since it's not really used so much in the U.S. I'm going to introduce in our sort of end of our time here um, and talk a little bit about somatic. We spent the most time in our constitutional inherited ones where a lot of pharmacogenetic testing is done, but I wanted to mention briefly about somatic variants. So this is, again, our, um, our a lot of our companion diagnostics where you have BRAF or um, or ALK or various other ones, and then there are drugs that go with those um, with those um, changes in those um, in in the tumor. Um, our last and sort of final example that I'm going to talk about is chronic myelogenous leukemia. Um, it was in the early 60s described as a Philadelphia chromosome, which is a translocation, uh, a 922 translocation. And in the 80s, it was determined that um, there was two genes that were fused together, um, and there's there's several um, there's a major breakpoint, a minor breakpoint, and and a, a, and a other breakpoint or, or very minor breakpoint. But in the late 90s, um, imatinib mesylate or Gleevec was was discovered that it was it can be used to um, treat. Um, uh, CML or chronic myelogenous leukemia. So, <clears throat> Gleevec is a small is a small mo molecule inhibitor of um, uh, tyrosine kinases or TKI, TKIs, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. One thing that's not really discussed much is that. Gleevec is also largely an inactive is an inactive drug that is metabolized um, through the 3A4 and the 3A5 pathway. Remember, if you this is one of those medications that you can't take with grapefruit or grapefruit juice because it 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 um, inhibits the 3A4 pathway. And in Caucasians, actually, most all Caucasians are poor metabolizers for 3A5. Um, so if you're Caucasian and you're a poor metabolizer for 3A5, this 3A4-5 complex, and you take grapefruit juice and you block this, you're really blocking Gleevec to become its inactive, to prevent it from becoming its inactive form and, and, and won't be able to tr um, um, work on the chronic myelogenous leukemia. You also take Gleevec for um, gastrointestinal stroma tumors or GIS that harbor kit mutations. So if we look at Gleevec or Matinib and it gets in the body, again, it goes through this three, this is its major pathway through 3A4 to become its active form, um, to become its, its active form, which then can be bind to the BCR able Fusion project, pro, um, fusion gene or fusion protein to to pro, to prevent or and treat um, CML. There are people that over time become resistant to Gleevec or imatinib-mesylate, and that many of them develop a second mutation in the tyrosine kinase binding domain, and the most common one is called T3. 
3151i. Um, and if this does, if they develop this, there are additional um, drugs available that can be used to treat that, especially when you become resistant to Gleevec. Um, there, I will remind you that um, much of this information is available uh, on Farm GKB as well as on the CPIC website. Um, here's an ex here's a probably. Um, I don't remember when I last updated this, but a fairly recent list of, of many of the drugs and the genes that um, have um, drug dosing guidelines. Um, I just wanted to mention largely the CPIC guidelines. Um, CPIC has walked a fine line in the sand. Um, they neither promote uh, nor do they not promote. Um, genetic testing for this, they actually look at is there evidence for the gene and the drug that if you have the genetic information, you can, you can have, you can guide the dosage or recommend alternative drugs based on that. And they, they do systematic evidence reviews and they update this every probably about every two years they update the guidelines and, and the literature around each of the genes and the drug, drug gene pairs. So uh, our sort of, sort of last slide here in conclusion is that this is a rapidly, pharmacogenetics is a rapidly growing field. Um, it's just not your genetics that af um, affect drug metabolism, but also the environment affects drug metabolism. And genotype, phenotype correlations, why, are, why it can help guide drug, drug information and or prescription information are, are still somewhat, are still somewhat imprecise but can serve as guidelines to personalize medicine. And that's my end of my talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki, very much. Um, I appreciate that. It's a fantastic talk. And I, I have a, um, a couple of questions. Uh, one is, um, what do you think are the uh, um, drug gene pairs, or, or the, let's just say the drugs to start with, uh, which are getting the most attention in real practice right now? In other words, what are the ones that um, uh, insurance companies may, may be most likely to see uh, come across as a test with requests to pay for? So, um, so a few years back, um, the one of the ones that probably would be um, seeing quite a bit, um, definitely the companion diagnostics. So those are sort of a given. The other ones people may see is um, for stents. Um, for stents, you would see with clopidogrel and 2C19. Um, that seems to be well covered by insurance and insurance companies. Um, some of the other ones, uh, which are probably a little bit more rare, maybe TPMT with the azothioprine, especially in, in children. Um, that uh, it's one of the drugs that's used in. in that I didn't mention that's in, used in, in some child, child cancers, childhood cancers. Um, that one, let me go back to my list and, and see. Um, the other ones um, are the HLA ones, um, such as, um, uh, I'm, I'm like looking at my list real quick and I know I'm overlooking them. Carbamazepine, a little bit less so. And um, Abacavir is a companion diagnostic. Um, and if you have HLA B5701 uh, and you take Abacavir, you're at increased risk for Steven Johnson syndrome, which is a severe allergic reaction to the drug where you're skin sort of comes off. 
um, that's that's um, one that that is being seen. And the other one, interestingly enough, is um, Ivacaftor for cystic fibrosis. Um, many before somebody's put on Ivacaftor, they already should know what their CF mutation status is. So I'm not sure that one is really combined because it's used to make the diagnosis of CF, and then once you know what the mutations are, then you can take Ivacaftor. Um, some of the other ones less so. And and so the, just to get back to the companion diagnostics, so so basically those drugs are approved for use when uh, in, in partnership with the test. So in some ways you're not supposed to use the drug without doing the test, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, according to the FDA, yeah. Yes. So so um, if, if, the, if there's a good indication for that medication and, and poor, poor indications for alternatives, then it, it sounds justified um, to, to go ahead and do those tests. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, my next question is about what um, what the insurers will see when a test is ordered or when it's billed. Do they see um, uh, the the a CYP label? Do they see the list of um, uh, star alleles that are tested for? Uh, what what do they end up seeing, or do they just see it like a tier two CPT code? So. Most of the pharmacogen, the main pharmacogenetic genes, the HLAs, the 2C9, 2D6, 2C19, there is actually gene-specific or the Tier 1 CPT codes, um, as well as CS has a, a Tier 1 specific CPT code. Um, some of the other genes, such as DPYD, TPMT, SLOCA 1B1, uh, CYP384, 3A5, those ones are currently in Tier 2, um, currently in Tier 2 as of so, 2007. So it makes it even, even harder for the insurance companies to, to sort of track um, what they're actually um, paying for and, and seeing and what the requests are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so they may have to do a little extra work to, to figure that out um, based on yes. the clinic reports and so forth, yeah. Right. But normally, uh, and I don't know how each insurance company would do it, um, it is recommended in the AMA CPT coding book that if you're, it's a Tier 2 gene that you're supposed to provide the gene Gene, the Hugo gene name, and I don't know if all systems are set up to transmit the Hugo gene name or not. So interesting. So you're supposed to include it, but the systems may not have a field field to transmit it, so they may not on the other end see it. Correct. Um, and then it also doesn't transmit what the star alleles that we're being tested for are. No. Right. Okay. Um, I have another just sort of final um, just information question. So um, there's a, a high incidence of, uh, of G6PD deficiency in like Mediterranean populations. Yep. Um, and there are medications that um, those people shouldn't take or which the doses should be adjusted for. Is that considered a pharmacogenomic um, allele? Yes. And if you look, um, there's Raspier case. That oh, okay. is associated yeah. with G6PD or G6PD deficiency. Um, and interestingly, um, so there is CPIC guidelines around some G6PD deficiencies. Um, most G6PD, especially because it's X-linked, in males is very easy to diagnose by a biochemical assay. The problem is it's in female carriers um, who have one G6PD deficiency allele and, and have a normal one, it's hard to, that biochemical test doesn't work very well for them. And mm -hmm. unless they're sick or they're taking a medication and then it makes them sick or sicker, um, the, the biochemical test isn't very good. And, and then the DNA test would be the preferred method for, um, for women who, have, who are carriers for G6PD deficiency. Great. Interesting. Super. 
Well, thank you, uh, um, Vicky, very much for uh, coming and giving this talk uh, to round out our uh, Ensure Education webinar series sponsored by uh, NHGRI and the ISCC, uh, Ensure Education Working Group. And um, I look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. All righty. Bye. Bye-bye.